And we are live, everyone. Welcome to episode 24 of Cellular Healing TV. This is David Asarno, and today I am joined with Dr. Pompa. Welcome, Dr. Pompa. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're at the seminar that I will be joining you in probably a couple hours. <laughs> so. Yes, and we've got uh, over 100 uh, health practitioners joining us this weekend here in Salt Lake City, don't we? We do. I'm excited uh, to teach them. I'm excited to be there. You there? Can you hear me? Yep, I, I, I've got to remember. Hold on. There we go. I had the screen going in the background to make sure everything was set up right. So, well, this week we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, another 180 degree difference, something that you live, something you talk about, something that uh, I guess maybe we'll even talk about your, your future book that you're going to be, be launching out, that you're working on right now. Um, but most of our listeners have heard about gluten. Um, and, and in fact, when I was growing up, we never heard about gluten issues. Um, so, it, Dr. Pompa, is this a fad or is this for real? Yeah. You know, I, I, it's amazing because I had a conversation recently um, with somebody and, and they basically were stating that, well, you know, this gluten thing, it's a, you know, there's many people who don't believe in it. <clears throat> well, my gosh, I, when I heard that, I was like, really? I mean, that's still on the street. And this, he's in dental school. So he's hearing this from a lot of his professors that, you know, the gluten thing is a bunch of bunk. Um, well, I said, well, first of all, to deny gluten allergy is like denying the sun in the sky. You know, um, I think the better question is, you know, is like all of a sudden, you know, why do we have this problem, right? I mean, it's like, where did this come from? But, I, I, David, I, I think that there is a lot of myths and bunk around and hype around the gluten problem. I, I think what we're finding out is it's kind of like the, you know, some of these uh, things like bad fats, right, and um, artificial sweeteners and low fat. It becomes a very slick marketing tool, but oftentimes the product that they're marketing is more unhealthy. So there's a lot of myths around gluten, and hopefully we can clarify that today. Um, because so the fact is is just to answer the question is yes are gluten allergies real you better believe that they are do they happen in everybody no there's a reason but there is a lot of false stuff around this topic and we need to clarify it so what's changed between growing up in the 70s and what we're experiencing today that it's so prevalent yeah because David uh, you know at your age do you remember anybody having a gluten problem Honestly. I don't. I don't when I was a kid. You remember everyone having a peanut allergy? Um, I don't, actually. Yeah, not me. <laughs> okay, yeah. Today you can't, you know, if you bring peanuts in a school, um, you know, it, it's like, you know, having a bomb, right? I mean, it's, you're gonna, the problems are going to happen. Uh, well, gluten, what the heck is going on with gluten, right? I mean, you know, it's gluten-free this and gluten-free that. I mean, this is in vogue, man. You're pretty cool um, today if you... Uh, have gluten-free products, right? Um, five years ago, two years ago, uh, you were a definitely, the, you know, you gluten-free what? You know, you were a nerd in school if you had a gluten-free product. Now, today, you're cool, man. You're in the in-group. So, are, Go ahead, so are, they, are, they, are these healthy, these gluten-free products, are they healthy for you? Ah, yeah. The answer to that is probably 98% of them are not healthy for you. So I know that we've got some of our listeners' attention at this point. Before we get there and they answer the question why, so you can definitely ask me why is that, uh, let's talk about why gluten all of a sudden is a problem. Uh, you know, look, uh, we've talked about GMO. We've talked about, you know, genetically modified organisms. But even before that, uh, you know, that started happening in the 90s, um, in the 2000s. But in the 70s, um, and even maybe as early as the late 60s, you know, we started hybridizing grains. We started changing them by hitting them with gamma rays and different things and altering the DNA that way. So GMO is taking one inserted gene, putting it in something, and giving it a specific function by putting in one single gene that gives it that so-called new function. Well, hybridization is a little different than that. We're just kind of cross-breeding different plants and therefore changing things, right? 
Well, we took something called, there, in fact, there was a brilliant guy who won a Nobel Prize called Norman Borlaug, and um, he created a wheat, a different wheat called dwarf wheat. Well, why would he do that? Well, his goal was noble. His goal was um, very good. He said, you know, one of the problems with world hunger is wheat, if we could just make it more available and, and easier to harvest, because it's so hard to harvest, it's uh, very difficult, and um, it's very susceptible to drought and environmental conditions, even wind, because the initial, the um, original wheat, which was called einkorn and emmer, they were like, you know, four to six feet tall, um, and these are wheats that have been around for a long time. Well, they're hard to harvest, and they're definitely uh, affected by the environment pretty easy. So he created something called dwarf wheat through this hybridization and crossbreeding process. Uh, Norman probably deserves his Nobel Prize. He's definitely made an impact in world hunger. However, Norman, good old Norman, created a new problem, um, and that would be world obesity. <laughs> he definitely created part of that problem as well. Not all of it. Can't blame it all on Norman. Um, but these new breeds of wheat, and, and now we have a problem with many different grains, right? Um, they're higher in a, a sugar called amylopectin, which is a super sugar. It raises glucose, blood glucose, more than table sugar. Yeah. So yes, eating your grains raises your glucose more than table sugar, direct right into the mouth white sugar. So yes, grains are super sugars. Um, wheat is a very, very super sugar, which raises glucose. But the other problem was, is Norman created at least 14 different strains of a protein called gluten that our bodies never saw before. So Norman then created something very different to our immune systems. Well, why isn't everybody affected when they eat wheat or other grains? Well, it's because people who have a leaky gut, where things can go through the gut and leak directly into our bloodstream, these proteins are very small and they leak across that gut. Not everybody has a leaky gut. And when they do, um, it starts to drive your immune system to create antibodies against these glutens. So then the next time you eat it, hours later, even a day later, you're driving inflammation in your body and you wonder what's going on and why you have headaches and joint pain and autoimmune where your body's attacking itself. Yes, it's even linked to thyroid and I mean the conditions go on. When you take gluten out of these people's diet, their condition gets 80% better. Uh, we have an epidemic of celiac disease, Crohn's disease, inflammatory gut disease, a lot of it which is being caused by gluten. In, in our past show, David, we talked about glyphosate. That's the yeah. chemical that so many people are ingesting from the foods that they're eating, right? We no, know no. glyphosate is one of the leading problems with causing leaky gut. And now they're ingesting this foreign protein, this new protein that we never grew up on. Our kids are growing up on it. And if they have leaky gut because they eat conventional food, eating glyphosate, which most do have a leaky gut, then they develop antibodies to gluten. So are gluten-free products good? Well, potentially, because, yeah, taking gluten out of your diet for so many people today, especially younger people, this is a major, major help to them because they have massive allergy to this protein that we never grew up on, David. So it's not the grains, it's what man has done to the grains that becomes really the bigger issue. So even if it's gluten-free and even if it's organic, it, it could potentially still spike sugar. Yeah, yeah. matter of fact, I guess that brings me right into the, that question that you had. Well, what about these gluten-free products? What about them? Well, they're using things like tapioca flours, you know, cornstarch. I mean, the list goes on, right? And all these replacements are even more super sugars than, you know, the grain, uh, the amylopectin A that's in the grain. So, yeah, these things become these worse than white bread glucose risers. You know, so we know that white bread raises glucose more than table sugar, you know, and, uh, you know, all these things, you know, look, yeah, the sugar problem in America is more due to grains than it is table sugar, but the key um, is is that these gluten-free products are loaded with things that drive up glucose. So they're making us fat. So yes, they don't have gluten, but there's multiple other problems. It's driving inflammation. Most of these products are loaded with bad stuff. The gluten-free thing is in vogue. You want to sell pro a product, put gr gluten-free, still low-fat or non-fat, that still sells products. Um, and, you know, 
no trans fats. I mean, all these things sell products, but that doesn't make the product healthy, David. Natural, right? Remember the day when you put, if you put on there all natural, you would sell a product. It still works, but just because a product says it all natural doesn't it doesn't make it healthy at all. You know, it doesn't sugar. necessarily mean anything. Corn syrup. There are a lot. They say that's all natural. <laughs> well, and and we wonder why kids these days are having more attention uh, challenges in school. And we look at what do most people start their day with? It's grains. Yeah, they raise glucose right out of the gate. They raise yeah. glucose and then it comes down. They raise glucose and then it comes down. They raise glucose and then it comes down. You know, inflammation, 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 triggering genes. You know, we all sit here as an expression of our DNA, uh, whether it's good or bad. Uh, every time you raise glucose and drive inflammation, you're affecting that DNA. You're affecting, you know, turning on bad genes, turning off good genes, taking years off your life. But so these gluten-free products, yeah, they're, you know, gluten-free, but again, it's, it opens up a whole other Pandora's box of problems. So the key is, is you know, eating grain free for most people is a must. If you're really healthy, you can you have grain in your diet? Yeah, I believe you can. Uh, your genetics would determine how much that you could get away with with that before you start getting fat and lack that energy. But um, you know, I mean, very healthy people can get away with certain grains, which I call ancient grains. You know, grains that haven't been through this hybridization process, the grains that haven't been gen genetically modified. You know, grains that haven't been bred to be super sugars. And, and, and listen, folks, the whole grain that you're eating, your whole grain bagel, these are not the grains that I'm talking about. Remember, you know, I, I think, you know, Bill Davis said it best, two pieces of whole grain bread in the morning, toast, or your whole grain bagel that you ate this morning raises glucose more than a 12-ounce soda. Okay, so whole grain, not the key. You know, when we talk about ancient grains, we're talking about things like, you know, quinoa, amaranth, um, you know, most grains that people haven't heard of. I would even say wild rice, you know, to, uh, rice is even being genetically modified, so we have to be careful there. Um, you know, but again, a, a lot of these more ancient type of grains, uh, you know, are definitely better options. But again, most people today, they can handle very little grain in the diet. You know, once we get above 20% of our caloric intake being grain. Oh, and by the way, that's most people listening, right? We start to see conditions and diseases. You know, humans just aren't meant to eat the amount of grain, period, that we eat. Uh, you know, we're ignoring fats and pro quality proteins and quality fibers and even quality carbohydrates like vegetables uh, because of our grain addiction. In this country, we're 50, 60 percent of our calories from grain, which is driving obesity even all the whole grains that everybody's eating, it's driving conditions like arthritis, it's driving autoimmune, it's driving allergies. And then of course now we're in the GMO world and you know, phew, where does it end, David? You, know, you want to get healthy, start taking grain out of your diet. I mean that's, you know, that's where it starts. Well, and, and the, the challenge most people have is it's, it almost, it's almost like there's an addiction there. There is, because Things that raise glucose create addictions. Matter of fact, uh, gluten is an addictive thing. Uh, we talked about you know, the damages of gluten driving inflammation. Well, we know gluten actually uh, affects the same part of the brain called opiate receptors uh, that create every addiction that we know of, right? So gluten uh, becomes addictive. It becomes, especially when it's leaking across your gut directly into your bloodstream. So, yeah, I mean, this is an, a massive addiction. Grains are addictive for multiple reasons. So I know, I mean, when you people are eating things like rice and oatmeal and non-gluten grains, all right, you know, it's better. I, I mean, uh, you know, you definitely don't want someone who's sensitive to gluten even touching it. Um, even, even a small, once your immune system reacts to it, even something cooked in the same oven. So you get a gluten-free pizza that was cooked in the same oven as a, a product that had gluten on it. Guess what? That, the, there's... Most kids that are gluten sensitive react to that, That's and all of a sudden they're going on gluten free, and, why, and all of a sudden they having episodes um, of inflammation and ADD, and they're wondering why because their gluten free pizza got uh, gluten on it from the pizza that was cooked there before. I mean, that's how crazy these allergies are to this protein. That's how crazy the immune system can drive the inflammation and all the symptoms. So this is, this is a huge problem. David, listen, in a lot of grains today, and this is one of the problems why I hate grain, right, 
is we have other problems besides gluten. There's other proteins that we're identifying that are even, you know, just as problematic, arguably more, and we'll talk about one in another product. But, um, you know, there's things like lectins and phytates and all these anti-nutrients that become very inflammatory for people who have leaky gut. So that's why taking grains out of someone's diet, you know, period, is very important in someone who's already challenged. And we can't have any exposure because it can drive inflammation. Now, you, you just mentioned something else, and, and I've heard you say that uh, beta A1 or casein and, and beta A1 casein uh, could, is it, is it that one that could be more toxic than gluten? Yeah. Yes, and uh, well, you've heard of gluten, casein, gluten free you know, diets. You know, casein is a protein that's in dairy. So I, I guess it would, you know, another great question would be like, what happened to dairy, right? I mean, what? Well, well yeah. Well, I mean, seriously, what what happened from the time, you know, what's the difference, and why over in some some uh, developing countries they don't have problems? Let's look at India and here in the United States. What's the difference between the cows? Isn't a cow a cow? Yeah. No. Um, you know, when we say like, why is you know. Dairy, it causes all this mucus problems. I can't eat dairy. I, why all these people can't eat dairy all of a sudden? What happened? I mean, for thousands of years, people consumed dairy successfully as a mainstay. The, the Considered the strongest, healthiest people in the world, this group called the Maasai tribe in Africa. They, they live off of it, right? What's, so what's going on? Well, is it the dairy or what man has done to it? Is it the grain or what, is it what man has done to it? Right? It's what man has done to it that's made it so bad. Well, we genetically altered a cow to get it to produce more milk. In that process, we were successful, you know, just like Norman was in feeding more of the population. His wheat, uh, dwarf wheat, was very successful. But in that process, um, we created a damaged or denatured protein in milk. So, an ancient cow, the one that's in India and South Africa still, uh, not in this country, um, produces something called A2 casein, or beta A2 casein. Well, 99% of the dairy in the United States has a protein called A1 beta casein, which is an altered protein that comes from what we did to the cow to get it to produce more milk. So in that process, we denatured another protein. It's a seven-chain amino acid called BCM7 that le people that have leaky gut, once again, goes across the gut and drives immune reactions, and it can be ten times worse than gluten. So, yeah, it's what man has created these proteins. So, again, it's not dairy. I mean, dairy has, you know, really caught the bad rap. Uh, it's what man has done to it. When you get dairy that's, you know, we all, we've talked in the past about Beyond Organic. Um, you know, Jordan has 9,000 acres and they genetically bred back the cow not to have this protein. You know, now we can get something that, you know, I believe cheese, for example, is one of the healthiest foods on the planet, period. Why? I would say it's even more of an important food today than ever because cheese really has and makes up a lot of the deficiencies that most Americans have. We talked last week about the five vitamin deficiencies, right? Yeah. She literally has most of those uh, those things. Oh my gosh, my battery power is going. I have nine percent. I think we can make it. I might have to run downstairs and get my plug. But cheese, think about this. Cheese takes in the sun. You know, well, cheese takes in the sun. The grass that the cows eat take in the sun, and it has all these nutrients in it because of the sun, um, and all the good bacteria in the soil that the cows eat the grass and then it comes out into the milk. Cheese is literally this little ecosystem of nutrients that occurred at that time, you know, with the sun and the weather, etc. Loaded with fat soluble vitamins like vitamin D, like vitamin K2, which we said are the two greatest deficiencies. Loaded with fats like saturated fats and cholesterol, which we say are the number one fats people need today. The perfect ratio because the cows eat the grass of omega-6 and omega-3 fats that we need to fix the cell as well. So it has all these amazing nutrients in it. Oh, but if you're eating a cow that has beta A1 casein, genetically altered, it screws up the whole thing. Oh, if we have a cow that eats grain instead of grass, oh, now, now we've made a product that causes disease. Instead of being the healthiest food you can consume, now it becomes one of the most poisonous. 
And it's like 180 it's degrees. David, it's 180 degrees. Once again, man takes the most precious food. Oh, why is cheese? Oh, I forgot the number one thing, David. What else does cheese have? This a massive holding tank for unique bacteria. You could never get in a pillar of powder. So that's the other epidemic, right? Is humans are losing this bacteria that sure. we need for our cells to work, our hormones to work, our immune systems to work. And we talked about that on past shows. Cheese represents all these things. So we messed it up. I'm t it's 180 degrees opposite. Isn't that the way the enemy works, right? I mean, it's you know the, the, one of the most healthiest foods that humans can eat. And it travels well. You can take cheese with you anywhere. I take it everywhere I go. You know, so, perfect so, protein. Perfect. So where do you where do you get the perfect protein that has the beta A2 casein? Oh, you know what? I'm gonna ask my wife. Yes, no, no. My charger to my my uh, computer. Oh, it's, hey, David. It's dying. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, folks, we have exactly seven percent and counting. If she can get it here fast, we'll keep it. Oh, there's here's our show. There's Remy. <laughs> she got a new. Hey TV. Remy. What? Everyone knows Remy. Remy, you're live on TV. Yeah, right. Okay, okay. So, anyways, um, I yeah. So we were talking about cheese as being the perfect. So, so, so where do you get the the good cheese? Where do you get this? I mean, yeah, can, you, I mean, can you, know, you go to Whole Foods and just get it? Well, some. You know, here's the thing: goat goat milk and sheep has not been changed. It's still A2 beta casein, which is the good one, right? It hasn't been changed to the A1. So you're always good there. Raw is always better. Raw has all the enzymes still there. You know, they're not killed by the heat, all the good bacteria. So yes, you can get it in your grocery store. Cow is where the challenge is. I said 99% of dairy, cow dairy, I should have been more clear, is A1 casein. That's where uh, Beyond Organic comes in. You know, if you look at my freezer out there, I have all this, you know, Beyond Organic cheese and products because all of Beyond Organic's cow uh, products are A2 casein. They're from ancient cows that have been genetically bred back to not have A1 casein. So that's the issue. So we're hooking up here our, that's what I love about cellular, uh, this internet TV. We can be so informal, right? Um, we can, we, right we, we, we can be formal and casual. casual. Yeah, we'll trade some other animals in in a minute. This is all good. So and we could do it from hotel room. See? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, hey, we were so, down so, to five percent, and we 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 lived through it. We're charging again. So, so here's a question for you. Our, our, we've got a lot of these digestive issues going on. We talked uh, about grains. We talked about casein. Um, are probiotics the answer? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know. Probiotics have really become in vogue, you know, kind of like gluten, right? Again, you know, 10 years ago, you know, no one knew what the word probiotic was. Just like five years ago, no one knew what the word gluten was, yeah. But um, it's been in vogue. But listen, I, we have thousands of bacteria in our gut. And I, we're discovering more, um, you know, monthly probably. Um, even more important discoveries is we're discovering how these bacteria in our gut um, are interacting with our hormones, our cells, um, our immune system. And when we lack certain bacteria, we can't control our immune system and we end up in autoimmune. When we lack certain bacteria, we can't even make certain immune cells. When we lack certain bacteria, uh, we become very um, sensitive to different things and foods and, um, and we can't even uh, control our hormones, right? So we know that the relationship between these bacteria is how we get so much function. Um, they literally communicate with our cells and our DNA, and they give that cell function it would have never have had. Uh, you know, in the Human Microbiome Project, we started realizing this connection. So amazing stuff. But David, you know, the the pill that people take, there's maybe five to ten bacteria strains, the most common ones. But what about the other thousand? You know, what about so many of those? It's not there. I, I'm a believer in fermented foods. Um, I talk about my three F's of how to fix a gut. Fermentation, fasting intermittently like we do, fixes guts. And oftentimes we need even fecal microbial transplant where you take, you know, um, bacteria from another human and oftentimes need to transplant it. And that's become very popular even in mainstream hospitals today. Um, so getting unique bacteria back in the gut is critical today and it will not happen 
from a pill a probiotic. Um, now, again, am I against probiotics? No, I, I'm not. I, it can benefit many people, but it's very limited on its scope. We need to get these unique bacteria. That's why ingesting these products like the cheese I was talking about or a product like Amasi or some of these products that Beyond Organics created, um, it, it's, it's very important. Or even fermented vegetables, David, carry even different bacteria. Fermentation has gone out um, of vogue when refrigeration became popular. We have to, used to have to ferment products to keep them uh, from spoiling, right? We don't do that anymore. So, you know, we're really missing a lot of bacteria. People are um, eating products that have been sprayed, killing bacteria that we used to eat on, get from fruits and vegetables, eating these things. Uh, we don't get that today. Uh, even when we do, we wash it all off, typically. and So we become void in bacteria. Oh, not to mention the hygiene thing. Everyone's slathering themselves in antibacterial soaps and antibacterial everything. Well, what we've done is we've altered what is called the microbiome. We have a microbiome on our skin. That's like um, healthy people have all these very unique and variety of bacteria on our skin which protects us. When we kill that by using these soaps constantly, now it allows the bad guys to accumulate there. You see? So anti you know, bacterial soaps, they're actually a culprit in causing more disease ultimately. Oh, and the antibiotics that we take that have become very popular. Um, we're wiping out our good bacteria. And now these bad guys are able to come in following the antibiotics and take over. So we live in a, a world right now that is afraid of microbes. Media has caused it, still causing it. And yet the microbes, healthy people, are just slathered in microorganisms, bacteria. Matter of fact, what we know now is when we swab healthy people in here or out here, they have a host of varieties of bacteria. Unhealthy pe uh, people have less variety and less microbes. Oh, here's one, David. Obese people, or let's talk even just mice for a, a fun thing. Yeah. They, their gut, if we analyze their bacteria in their gut, they have a, a less of a variety of microbes in their gut. The skinny mice have a great variety. So when we put these two mice together in the same cage, it's interesting because mice, they eat their own poo, right? They, they, they eat their own waste. <laughs> That's what they do. So the fat ones are eating the skinny ones, skinny ones are eating the fat ones. So the question was, you know, how will it affect the mice? So what happened was is the fat mice, when you put them in with skinny mice, they become skinny. Even though, I mean, separated, they were eating the same diet. So you think, well, it's the diet. No, no, no. We're talking about the same diet. Genes are turned on in these mice and they're fat. We put them together. What happens is the fat ones are eating the, the poo of the skinny ones. They became skinny. Why didn't the skinny ones become fat? Because their variety of microbiome had the positive effect on the, the non-variety of organisms of the fat mice. So the point is, is the greater variety of microbes you have, the healthier you are, the skinnier you are. Killing off microbes, whether it's antibiotics or antibacterial soaps, 180 degree philosophy is that they're causing disease. We need more bugs. We need to be playing in the dirt. Our kids need to be dirtier. <laughs> Our kids need to play in the dirt like we did as a kid. Our kids need to eat dirty things with you know, soil, but again, you can't eat soil sprayed with glyphosate. Organic soils, gardens, eating the bacteria, you know, and being exposed to the bacteria. We know that kids that live on farms around animals and exposed to different parasites and more bacteria, they're healthier. There's less autoimmune and less challenges. We know this. But yet it's not making it into the media. So. And it, most people think it's just the low fat, low carb um, diets all by themselves are going to lose weight. And the, the true answer of how to get well, how to heal yourself, how to get your life back, uh, how to lose weight is, is, is 180 degrees from what most people are talking about. Expose yourself to more microbes, what you put in here and what you, you know, are exposed to even outside. Play in the dirt. Play in the dirt, you know, hug and play with animals, uh, you know, I don't know, I, we, could, we could go on with that, uh, that, you know, don't shower, I, that's where I was going with that, I'm kidding, I, I mean, there's a, there's a truth I, to I sure, I sure hope you are, we'll see you in a little bit. I mean, there's a truth to washing your hands, right, I mean, you know, washing your hands is a good thing, but with antibacterial products, bad, soap, you know, regular soap and water is a different animal, it doesn't kill those good bacteria. Right? It's a, you know, it's a completely different thing. Uh, it's the antibacterial products 
that wipe out all bacteria, good and bad, and that's bad. So. Up oh, we got you back. Okay. We lost you for a second. Uh, so, so this was a, a, a fun-filled, informative episode. Uh, is there anything that you would like to leave our viewers and listeners with today? Well, I always say this, David. If everyone's making a left, you might consider making a right. If everyone's making a right, you might want to consider making a left. Meaning that if everybody's starting to go buy all these gluten-free products, right, um, you might want to make a left. You know, it seems like if the masses go this way, then, uh-oh, something, you know, might be wrong. Well, the masses seem like they're just buying all these gluten-free products. You might want to make a left <laughs> because they're... Typically, if the masses uh, are going in that direction, there's probably suspicion and there's a problem. Yeah, so be cautious uh, that gluten-free products, you know, can be oftentimes more dangerous, more inflammatory, and glucose risers. So, you know, yes, is gluten potentially bad? Yeah, it is. Um, but, you know, be cautious of the, the accepted media products. So... Dr. Papa, thank you as always, and next week we'll be back with our co-host, uh, Warren Phillips. So, Dr. Papa, thank you for everything. I'll see you in uh, about an hour or so. Uh, everyone, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Cellular Healing TV. If you want more information, go to www.drpompa.com, www.drpompa.com. Check out Dr. Papa's brand new website his new categorization, how he puts his articles out there, much easier to find and search. So, uh, Dr. Papa, thank you. Everyone, create yourself an awesome weekend. Thank you. Thank you, David.